Well there. Uh, thank you for uh, inviting me uh, tonight. Uh, when I heard about speaking on, on this subject, I was uh, not sure whether I should stick to the events of 1918 and the German Revolution, or perhaps take it in a bit further, 1920, 21, even 23 which all are valuable lessons, I would say. But of course, uh, trying to uh, compact all that into an hour is quite uh, an impossible task, really. But uh, perhaps we'll see how, how we go along. The events uh, of a hundred years ago will be celebrated in one form or another on the 11th of November, the anniversary, the centenary of the signing of the Armistice. Of course, uh, you will not uh, really get a feeling for what happened at the time, and certainly you will not get an understanding of why the World War came to an end as it did. Because the World War I ended on the basis of the revolution in Germany of 1918. It wasn't the generals and the general staff that brought the war to an end, but ordinary sailors in particular, but soldiers and workers, who said enough was enough and carried out a revolution. I think that uh, 1918, 1919 is a year of a revolutionary tide in Europe, also beginning with the Russian Revolution of November 1917, October in the old calendar. And uh, obviously we, uh, we learn a lot about the October Revolution, but not quite a lot, not much, I would say, necessarily about the revolution in Germany, mainly because the revolution in Russia was successful. The German Revolution wasn't successful. Although it could have been. That's the tragedy about it. And even Lenin said that if there could have been a successful revolution in Germany, that he was prepared to give up the revolution in Russia. And the reason for that is because, is because Germany was at the centre of Europe, the most industrialised country of Europe, as opposed to Russia which was a very backward country. And if a socialist revolution was successful in Germany, it would have meant the end of capitalism in Europe and, in, in effect, capitalism throughout the world. In other words, it would have changed the entire course of world history. And I would say it was in the balance. It was in the balance. In fact, the, the ruling class at the time were terrified of a German revolution. They were terrified of Bolshevism. And uh, they believed that uh, it was very much touch and go. The whole of Europe, said Lloyd George, the British Prime Minister, is affected by the spirit of revolution. And that summed up the whole of the situation at the time. And Germany was at the centre of this uh, threat. The revolution itself, or well, the anniversary of the revolution, the date was put as the 9th of November 1918. In fact, you could say that the anniversary was on the 3rd of November, because that was when you had the mutiny in Kiel of 100,000 sailors which began the whole process of the revolution. In fact, it's what, the second today? Tomorrow is the third. So 100 years ago, tomorrow, you had this heroic movement of the German sailors who were threatened with the, with the, with the death penalty, with court-martial. In fact, some of them were caught and, and they attended, they were tried for mutiny. 
and the authorities thought they could contain this mutiny. But rather than contain it, it spread like wildfire. And the reason for the mutiny was the desperation of the German general staff at the time, which wanted a victory at all costs, never mind the cost, a victory, a glorious victory, if you like, even if it went down in defeat. A victory for Germany, above all, a victory for the Kaiser. And rumours spread amongst the sailors that this battle was going to take place in the North Sea, where thousands, tens of thousands were going to lose their lives. And this was the spark, this was the resistance that began the revolution itself. War, if you like, was the uh, midwife of revolution, as it was in Russia, as it was in Germany and elsewhere. It was the spark that uh, set the whole thing alight. And the mutiny, which was unprecedented, spread to Kiel, uh, from Kiel, from one town to another, where the workers, in solidarity with the sailors, began to set up committees, as they called them, councils, workers' councils, sailors' councils, and soldiers' councils, because the, the, mut the mutiny spread to the army, the army was collapsing, and the workers themselves were moving in the direction of revolution. And above all, this meant that the setting up of their own committees, like a strike. Workers have a strike committee. In a revolution, they set up Soviets or workers' councils, as was the case in Russia in 1905 and in February 1917, as well as in October. And in, the parallels are, are, are quite stark, I would say, between the German Revolution and the February Revolution in Russia of 1917. It was a spontaneous movement. It wasn't called by a party. It was a spontaneous movement from below. Although paradoxically, the revolution itself begins at the top, as all revolutions do, by cracks at the top, where the ruling class begins to lose control of the situation. They can't govern as they did previously. And they wonder how they're able to get a handle, how they're able to uh, um, establish their own authority once again. Is it through repression or is it through concessions? It's the only choice they have. And the idea is to prevent revolution from below, there should be a revolution above. And that's why they initially brought in parliamentary government, in inverted commas, on the 3rd of October, with the Prime Minister, or the Chancellor, um, Max von Baden, or to give him his full title, Prince Max von da Baden, who was the nephew of the Kaiser, of the Emperor, with the task of introducing some kind of parliamentary fig leaf uh, as a means of quelling the masses and bringing into this government two social democratic ministers to give it a coloration, to give it uh, some justification. But of course, uh, by doing that, rather than quelling the thirst of, of people, it certainly and, uh, gave rise to a feeling that, well, if they could get some concessions, more could be got. It gave a rise of confidence, if you like, amongst the sailors, amongst the workers in Germany. And this attempt to... Uh, Prevent revolution from above certainly was the beginning of a factor to, to provoke revolution from below, as was the case in all revolutions, as is the case in the Russian Revolution as well. Uh, but the masses look beyond that. Once they get a feeling that there's no other alternative but to try and take power, then they move. And once they move, it's like a fire spreading very quickly from one town to another town. In fact, in a, in a space of a matter of days, from the 3rd of November until the 9th of November, 
The rule of Germany is embraced in an uprising of the workers and soldiers and sailors. The old regime is suspended in midair. It has no power. The workers are on the streets. There's a very good uh, book, an interesting book, by a man called Jan Walten, called Out of the Night. It's a biography of a man who uh, was a young, as a young man, he joined the, the Spartacist group during the war. And uh, it's, a, it's basically about the life, his life and the experiences of the German Revolution and beyond. And he describes there the, the, uh, the situation in Hanover of the, uh, the workers marching throughout the streets of Man in, in, a, in a torchlight procession, armed. Of course, they are arms at this time because the soldiers have, have uh, come home. Uh, they're not being demobbed, so they fraternise. So yet you have an armed uprising of the workers who immediately set up these councils. These embryos, you could say, of workers' power, just like the Soviets in Russia. It's an attempt by the workers to organise their own workers' state. And the old regime, again, is suspended completely in midair. There's no power. It lacks authority. But the power is in the streets, is in the working class itself, and in the armed forces, the troops, and in the sailors who have mutinied. And, uh, of course, the attempt to, to hold the situation from above is that they have to make sacrifices. And the first uh, port of call is to get rid of the, 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 the Kaiser. The Kaiser is the, is the figurehead of, the, of the, the regime, which is hated, and therefore they hope if they can remove the Kaiser, then that will quell the masses. Uh, of course, the Kaiser doesn't want to go. He sees this as a, a betrayal. He demands the army suppress the revolution. But he's told in un, no uncertain words, Sorry, sire, you haven't got an army. It doesn't exist anymore. And the realisation that the power is, is gone. And uh, hoping against all odds that he could retain something, he retains nothing. Although he doesn't declare... He is abdicated. He refuses to do so. It is the, his uh, nephew uh, that goes behind his back and says he is now abdicated. He, he hears it second hand. Not very happy, of course. But he, as he said, has to go into exile to Holland. And this revolution does the same everywhere because Germany at this time is not a unified country as you have in modern times, today, is broken up and made up of principalities, of, uh, of kingdoms. And each of these have got their own separate little kings and uh, monarchies and so on in this, this, uh, this patchwork of uh, authorities. But the revolution overthrows every single one of them. And they are terrified and have to go into exile and out. Very funny stories about the different people. The king's brother, for instance, is terrified of this revolution. And the only way he can escape is put on a false beard and uh, get into a car and put a red flag on his car as he drives towards the border. You've got uh, the king of Bavaria, who again begs the workers there not to put a red flag on his castle because it's its own private property. Of course, the, the workers don't say, uh, uh, take much notice. He goes into exile. They all disappear into exile. But for fear of being, well, the consequences are not very nice. Uh, workers taking uh, action with their own hands. They escape with their own lives, so to speak. And uh, the workers feel their power. In Bavaria, which is uh, quite a backward area of, of Germany, quite a rural area. But in Munich, there's a, an uprising of the workers. And a man called uh, Kurt Eisner marches into the local, or the, uh, the, the, the Landtag, the, uh, the local parliament, with 60 others, armed troops, and says to the gentlemen uh, assembled, get out. We're now declaring a socialist republic. And the next day, 
Flags appear in all the municipal buildings, including the churches. Posters go up that this is a, the Bavarian Workers' Socialist Republic. This is the, the real revolution happening from below. No one's organised it. It's a spontaneous movement of the working class. And they have power in their hands. And uh, they also realise the local committees, these local councils, should be organised into regional and national bodies. And this is what happens. In Berlin, the Berlin councils form a, uh, a Berlin committee, which then has the authority of the national uh, councils throughout Germany. So there's the, the potential for a successful revolution is there. The workers got power in their hands. The old regime is completely isolated in midair. It has no uh, armed bodies of men to impose themselves on the revolution. All it has and all it can rely upon is the old leaders of the Socialist Party. Of course, uh, to understand what has happened, you need a little, or a little bit, and understand a little bit of what has happened previously. In Germany, the Social Democratic Party was the biggest party. It was a Marxist party, in words, the biggest party in the world before the war. Huge apparatus, big support in the working class, big support. In, well, it founded the trade unions. That in 1912, a third, a 4.2 million votes, a third of the working class. 90 daily newspapers, not bad. It had a huge apparatus, huge authority in the working class. And it, in words, adhered to the ideas of Marxism. And therefore, if there was any revolution going to take place, it was going to be in Germany, quite, quite uh, visibly. But the party itself had grown up in a period of economic upswing under capitalism. And that caused a, a degeneration, particularly in the leadership, who rather than fight for revolution, started to fight for reforms. The revolution in words, in day-to-day -day deeds, who was fighting for reforms. Of course, we're all in favour of reforms. That's, you know, better wages, better lower hours. We're all in favour of that. And we fight for it. We're, but in the capitalism, they can give with the left and take with the right and so on. And the capitalist crisis, they can take these reforms away. So we have to say it should be linked to the, to the need to change society. And that was a big battle that took place inside the party. In fact, this is where Rosa Luxemburg comes in, who will be also well known uh, in the movement as a fighter for the ideas of revolutionary Marxism inside the German social democracy, not only against what they called the revisionists of Bernstein, but also the middle, light, the middle kind of types, the centrists of uh, Karl Kautsky, who was good at a good, good, good speaker, talk about revolution, but in practice, again, very much reformist. And Rosa Luxemburg, because she was very close to these <coughs> figures, close, could see exactly where the weaknesses were, and she thought that we must put words, it's got to, deeds got to be put in place of words. That we've got to fight for the revolutionary movement of the working class to overthrow capitalism rather than reform it. And uh, that was the big battle that went on in this organisation. It was a mass organisation, but the leaders were degenerated. They were reformists. And uh, Luxembourg organized a revolutionary opposition inside the party. But um, by the time 1918 came, a split had occurred in this party, and you have a new party being formed, two parties, the big party, the social democracy, which is reformist, and betrayed the workers in 1914 by saying we should support the war. And then there was a, a split in that party, and a party was called the Independence. The Independence, a big party, 120,000 in January 1917, during the war. It was the war that was creating this upheaval. And another figure that we should know is, is Karl Liebknecht. Karl Liebknecht was uh, the son of Wilhelm Liebknecht, who was the founder of the German Social Democratic Party. 
and was a very close friend of Marx. And uh, Karl Liebknecht went to jail in 1907 for producing a pamphlet against militarism, um, became well known in the Young Socialist, he was a leading Young Socialist, and then became a parliamentarian in 1911. He was on the left wing with Rosa Luxemburg, and when the Great Betrayal came in August 1914, First of all, he gave in to the pressure of the, this Labour group to, to conform. Within a couple of months, in December 1914, he votes against the war on the war credits. One against 110. And he becomes, an, becomes a national figure, an anti-war figure of the revolutionary tendency. Not only in Germany, but internationally. He's well known. Lenin knows him. He's known in Europe because of this outstanding courage of this person. So you have these two leading figures in Germany, Luxembourg and Liebknecht, the revolutionary faction. But they are in a very small minority. The big leaders who have now come to the service, surface are people now we haven't heard of before. Ebert, Noska, Scheidemann. These people we weren't heard of before, but they rise to the top of the Social Democratic Party. They are the reformists. And uh, the mass of workers in moving in the revolution in 1918, what did they look to? Well, they didn't look to Luxembourg and Liebknecht, they were a very small group. They looked to their traditional mass organizations, the social democracy, the, uh, and also this independent organization as well, but mainly the social democracy. But the leaders of the social democracy didn't want revolution. They were opposed to the revolution. And they were the ones which had taken into the, the government, first of all, of uh, von Baden, Prince von Baden. And then later, they were asked to come in to form a government as the, the only way they could stop this revolutionary wave was not having capitalists in the government, but give it all to the workers' leaders. Let them do the job. Let them hold the workers back because the workers have more confidence in them than they do in the others. And that's what they did. That was the, the last trick, if you like. The workers themselves moved towards revolution from below, but they looked to their leaders. And the leaders themselves were also looked to by the ruling class as the only barrier that they could see that would stop the, the revolution in Germany. So they, would, they said, you form the government. In fact, Max von Baden, this prince, gave up the, uh, the government and handed it over on the 9th of November to uh, Ebert of Noska and Scheidemann, the social democrats. You take it. And uh, the famous quote from um, Ebert it was like, revolution, I hate revolution like sin. He detested revolution. He was terrified of it. He was a, a liberal democrat. He just wanted to be in opposition within a, a bourgeois democracy. And therefore, his whole attempt was to block the revolution, to prevent the revolution, to undermine the revolution, in order to have some sort of democracy. But his very actions to undermine the revolution were not going to produce a democracy, but they were going to produce a reaction, which was going to be a bloody reaction in Germany later on. But he, um, they managed to pull together a government. The workers had the power, but the workers looked at this government. In fact, they, the government itself called itself after the uh, Workers' Councils proposed it, uh, a government of people's commissars. Right, and even that, that's a, an indication of how far they were prepared to go in words. Like in Russia, you got the commissars, they, had the, this kind of, they were the people's commissars. And they were going to form a government, and they wanted to get not just the majority social democrats in the government, but they wanted also to get the independents who were to the left of them also embroiled in the government as a, as a means of attempt, as a block, as a barrier 
to the movement of the working class. Um, the workers themselves had confidence in their leaders. You had the same thing in Russia, didn't you, in 1917 in February, when the, when the Soviets were established. Who led them? The Bolsheviks didn't lead them. The majority in the Soviets in February, right up until what, September, eh? were the Mensheviks and social revolutionaries. And they looked to the provisional government. In other words, they had no confidence in carrying through the revolution. Likewise in Germany as well. The Social Democrats and even the, the, the independents with no real idea where they were going. They also did not want to carry through the revolution. The difference was, in Russia, you had the Bolshevik Party, developed by Lenin and with, with Trotsky. And they were able to break through this uh, logjam and come to power on the basis of winning a majority within the Soviets, and thereby carry through the revolution all the way. Up until that time, you could say it was only half a revolution, and they completed it. Same in Germany. What you had, in effect, workers had the power in their hands, but it was still half a revolution, because they needed to clear out the government clear out the capitalists, clear out the landlords, as the Bolsheviks had done, and create a genuine workers' state and appeal to the workers in other countries. But the leaders of the German movement were against that. In fact, Ebert's first declaration on the 9th of November, in the middle of the revolution, was, everybody go back to your houses, we want law and order. Not exactly the most inspiring revolutionary uh, thought. Law and order. Back to your houses. Oh, come off the streets. But the workers didn't really take much notice of this appeal because they felt the power themselves. You can't put the, the genie back in the bottle, so to speak. The workers were now on the move. But the revolution itself is not a simple question. It's not a strike. The revolution transforms the entire situation and above those who, those who participate in it. They feel their own power. They feel uh, the difference. But that only, could only go so far. They then look to the government to, to, to dot the I's and cross the T's, so to speak. But the government is not interested in that. The government is preparing a showdown. Ebert, who becomes is the, the chancellor, the prime minister, is in league with the old general staff. And also a new formation that comes into being called the, the Free Corps, the Fry Corps, which are reactionary elements who are ex-army officers, the people who are the most reactionary types in the armed forces, those who have fought against the Bolsheviks in, in, the, in, the, uh, uh, in the Baltic states, these people are, are the scum, if you like. They are pulled together. Um, and the fascists are also involved in this kind of uh, movement. And they become the shock troops of the counter-revolution. They, they are prepared to go to the end in a counter-revolutionary way to destroy the revolution and the working class. And it is the government of the leaders of the government, the Social Democrats, rest upon these types in order to try and get their own way. Now, it's easier said than done. Obviously, you can't suppress a revolution by armed force if the masses are on the move. You have to wait till the thing dies down. You have to get a bit, uh, let, let, the, let, the, let, the, let things settle down, maybe, before moving in that direction. Although things did happen in that way. You had an attempted coup, a military coup, on the 6th of December. It was an attempt, it was a test in the ground. It didn't work, it, it fell back. You had another attempt of a provocation by the government on Christmas Day, the 24th and 25th of December, 1918, when there was in Berlin 
a, um, a military unit, a unit. They were sailors. The naval uh, unit was based in the, in the headquarters in the centre of Berlin. And the government, quite correctly, saw this as a threat to them and therefore wanted to get rid of it. And they staged a, staged a provocation to get rid of them. And it ended up in a confrontation where the armed forces were sent against these sailors, these naval uh, detachments. And it was through fraternisation that the attempted um, attack on these workers failed. It was the, they were fraternising with these with the armed forces, the ordinary soldiers who were coming to put them down. Who are you fighting? We are your, your friends. We are on the same side. They fraternised with them. And this uh, provocation collapsed. But it didn't last too long because they, uh, there was a, a witch hunt started to take place in the, in the, in the papers. They tried to finance. They had uh, organisations called the Anti-Bolshevik League who were created by big business, give them money. The finance a campaign of hysteria against the communists, the Spartacists, because the Spartacists at this time had formed a group. They were the embryo of the Communist Party that would be formed, and they were seen as, the, of, as Bolshevism, German Bolshevism. And therefore, there's a huge, um, like a hue and cry, a huge uh, campaign was waged in order to try and discredit and whip up a feeling against the most left-wing elements in the revolution itself. The, um, prior to this, the, the revolution had gone into a bit of a cul-de-sac, insofar as on the 16th of December, there was a, a conference call of all these workers' councils. And uh, they took important decisions. The Spartacists wanted them to take the decision that they should take power. They should be the same as in Russia, to create a Soviet Republic. Uh, but unfortunately, the delegates who made up this particular conference were lagging behind. A number of them were, were sailors, not from the work, not, not, from, not from the factories. A number were sailors, soldiers. They were lagging behind the real movement of the revolution. And instead of going for or voting for a Soviet Republic, they just went for elections to a national assembly, uh, which obviously that meant basically the revolution was going to go halfway. And uh, despite all the efforts by the left wing, by the Spartacists, there was big demonstrations called even during the Congress, quarter of a million workers in Berlin came on the streets calling for a Soviet Republic. So it shows the ferment that it was there. But without the uh, leaders of the councils being in favour of it, then you were in, an, in a minority position. You would have to struggle to win a majority, as the Bolsheviks did. The Bolsheviks were in a minority in February right up to September. They won the majority on the basis of patiently explaining their ideas. The difference between Russia, though, and Germany, and this is the fundamental lesson, is that the Bolshevik party had been created, or at least the, the basis of the party, had been created 15 years before. It was a faction of the Russian Social Democratic Labour Party. But Lenin believed it was for the fight for a, a genuine Marxist organisation. He had this split between I mean, Mensheviks and, and, and Bolsheviks. And uh, Lenin was very clear in this. The party was the essential ingredient to lead the workers to power. And uh, he strove to build that party. And uh, it was that successful adventure that allowed the revolution to be successful in Russia. Although the Bolsheviks said it's true, only had 8,000 members in February, but they had a lot of support in the factories. They'd, they were organized, well organized, and they were able to, to win over 240, build an organization of 240,000 by October and lead the working class to power. In Germany, they didn't have it. The Spartacists, Luxembourg and Liebknecht with the leaders, 
didn't organize uh, such a current, didn't organize a faction. It was a very loose, loose knit thing. And uh, by the time the revolution broke out, the organization was very, very limited. In fact, they only had 50 members in the whole of uh, Berlin. So the Spartans it didn't create such an organization as the Bolsheviks had done. If they had done so, then they would have been a different story altogether. And that was the failing of Luxembourg and Liebknecht, if you like. Although, to be honest about it, no one else understood it either. It was only Lenin who really understood the importance of building a revolutionary party. Other people didn't. Trotsky didn't at that time. James Connolly didn't. Uh, John McLean didn't. A whole host of people didn't know what they know. They were Marxists, but they didn't fully appreciate the importance of the revolutionary party. Of developing a cadre, a foundation, on which to lead the working class. And Trotsky draws the analysis of, um, of a piston box. He said, the movement of the masses in the revolution is like steam. It's enormously potentially powerful steam. But in order to make it a real power, it has to be trapped. It has to be channeled in order to make it very powerful through a piston box, he says. And he says, that's the party. That's the organization. Is the piston box to galvanize and direct the energy of the masses to take power. And without that piston box, without the party, the energy of the masses can dissipate. And it's exactly what happened in the revolution in Germany in 1918. The power was there, the steam was there, the energy was there, but it wasn't focused to take power. In fact, other parties stepped in, the Social Democrats, it led, channeled it in a different direction. And uh, that's one of the criticisms, if you like, of, of Luxembourg and Liebknecht. It's, not a, 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 it's, it's, it's a tragedy rather than a criticism in that sense. If they had only organized themselves more effectively, then they would have been in a, perhaps a greater position come the revolution <coughs> that they would be able to, to lead or give a leading light in the revolution. And that would, that's what was missing. And uh, as a consequence, the revolution itself then veers off. And like many revolutions, um, you can say that there's a, a frustration builds up, doesn't it? You know, that the power is in the, your hands, and yet you're losing it. You're losing the power. You know, you're not getting anywhere. Frustration builds up. And that happens in many revolutions. Um, it happened in the Spanish Revolution. You know, in, in May 1937, with, the, with the, 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 the May Days in Barcelona. You had at that particular point. Even in the Russian Revolution, you have the July Days, in, or June, July. The frustration of the, of the masses boils over, if you like. And the, the, the Bolsheviks tried to hold it back to try and contain it. There's, a, there's a, an attempt to recapture the initiative. And uh, that's what you had in the Spartacist week of January 1919. It begins on the 5th of January and ends on the 12th of January. And on the 4th of January, there's another provocation takes place. By this time, by the way... The government itself in Germany, which was made up of the Social Democrats, Ebert, Nosker, Scheidemann, and they also drew in the independents. They had three, three and three. It was a, a coalition government, a left coalition government. <coughs> but after the debacle of, of the Christmas Day uh, event, where they tried to get rid of the um, naval, the, uh, the, the sailors in, in, in Berlin, it led to a split in the government. And the independents, who were on the left, resigned from the government, created a government crisis. And the, and the pl places were filled by majority socialists. So you had a majority right-wing socialist government who were determined to put a block and a stop to the revolution, even if it meant bloodshed, by the way, even if it meant bringing in the Freikorps to put the workers down in Berlin. 
And one of the uh, ministers, uh, Noska, who became the Minister of Defence, he said that he was prepared to be the bloodhound of the revolution. I will be the bloodhound. Someone's going to play the role. I will do it. And that's what his role was. He had a, a direct link with the, the military heads and with the Freikorps. And through his instructions, there was an attempt to get rid of the left-wing police chief in Berlin, who was an independent, a very left-wing person. He was imposed by the revolution. They wanted to kick him out, remove him, because under his command was uh, 2,000 uh, poli left police in, in, in Berlin. They wanted to remove him from the scene. He refused to go, and therefore they attempted to get rid of him by force. And because of that, because he was a member of the independents, they protested against that and appealed to other organisations, the Revolution Shop Stewards, and, as, and also, at this time, that was just being created in, on the 31st of December, the 1st of January, 1919, was the creation of a German Communist Party. Very, very small, very ultra-left, very ultra-left, didn't want to bother with Parliament, didn't want to bother with the trade unions. They thought they could, they would, they could take an easy route, which is not possible. But nevertheless, they were, very, they were appealed, come, come and help us. Stop the government trying to remove this person. And they joined the Revolutionary Committee and they called a demonstration. And the demonstration on the 5th of November attracted a half a million people in Berlin. Half a million came out to demonstrate their loyalty to the revolution against the government and so on. A Revolutionary Committee, as I said, was formed. And they had the idea, let's get rid of the government. If that's the case... With all these people in favour of it, let's get rid of the government. And uh, they started to uh, try to work out plans how they should get rid of the government. And they, uh, they, they consulted and they consulted and they consulted and they consulted. They didn't get very far, they just didn't know what to do. And the workers who were waiting, and it was raining, what, they were waiting for some sort of lead, and no lead came. And eventually... The workers dissipated, and the government saw this as a, a sign of weakness, and they started to step in using military means from the Freikorps elements, reg regiments, to try and drive out this occupation. Because workers now started to occupy the, the newspaper of the Socialist Party, or well, Social Democrats, Vorwärts, was occupied. The whole the district uh, that would, had the newspaper area, all those buildings were occupied. So there's a challenge to the government. And the government, in effect, it was a provocation from the government and they were going to engineer a bloody confrontation with the workers. And that's precisely what they did. And uh, basically from the 5th until the 12th. And uh, there was... Uh, they recognised the workers would occupy the, the Vorfets and the other places, recognised that they, they couldn't survive. So they, they sent a delegation to the government to say, let's negotiate. And uh, the delegation was killed. They were taken away and shot. And there was not going to be any negotiation. And the Freikorps were used in order to, to bombard, to destroy that area, and eventually to take it militarily. And the workers were seized... I think there were 300 about seized. Many of them were taken uh, to courts, which were set up, and they were shot on the spot. And that was the end of the Spartacists as they saw it uprising. It wasn't organised with the Spartacists. They were involved, yes, because they went with their class, so to speak. But it wasn't a deliberate movement to take power on their behalf. Um, but it set off then... The counter-revolution, they saw this as their, their golden excuse and they launched a witch hunt to uh, basically eliminate the Spartacists physically and um, posters were put up all over Berlin 
There was a price put on the heads of Rosa Luxemburg, Karl Liebknecht, other leaders of the Spartacists. And uh, the posters also put up that they should be captured. And then there were even things in the newspapers, even in the Vorvets newspaper, poems about how they should string them up. In other words, the only way to eliminate these and create an organization, the only way to bring about peace and how to bring about stability is to get rid of these people. And that was the witch hunt that took place on the 12th, the 13th, the 14th, and the 15th of January. Luxembourg and Liebnick went into hiding in various places, safe houses. They stayed in Berlin. Perhaps that was a mistake. They should have left Berlin. They should have gone into hiding, as Lenin did, uh, you know, when he was uh, hunted in July 1917 in Russia. He went to escape to Finland. They were told, you better get out to let things cool down. But Luxembourg and Liebnick didn't do that. And finally, they were traced down and caught by an army unit and taken to the Eden Hotel in Berlin, which was the headquarters of a Freikorps uh, regiment. And the officer in charge said that they would never leave there alive and that they would be questioned before they would be transferred to an official prison. Of course, they were never going to be transferred to an official prison. The whole basis was to murder them in cold blood with the agreement of the Social Democrat government of Noska, of Scheidemann and so on. They had agreed to this murder and uh, first of all Liebnick was taken out of the hotel. He was beaten over the head and dragged into a car. He was taken not far down the road, thrown out of the car and then shot in the back. Next to Lee was Rosa Luxemburg. They sit the same way. They beat her over the head, pulled her into a car. They shot her through the head and they dumped her in the canal. He was frozen. A body sank in the canal. They didn't recover her body until May. That's the, the vengeance, if you like, of the, the ruling class. They saw Liebknecht and, and Luxembourg as the head of the revolution. And the only way they could destroy the revolution was to destroy them physically. And that's what they did. And that was the greatest tragedy, I would say, that befell the German revolution. These were the leaders. They had the authority. And they could have led the party, the Communist Party, in the years to come that could have been a success instead of a failure. And that was one of the greatest tragedies you have of the revolution. The revolution can't just go on indefinitely. The workers can't just be on the white heat activity all the time. An ebb takes place. Although throughout Germany... The revolution spreads throughout, not just in Berlin, throughout Germany. And throughout 1919, there are battles taking place one after another in the different towns and cities to put down the revolution. In Bavaria, for instance, the, uh, uh, under Hoffmann, the army and the Freikorps sent in to crush the revolution in Bavaria. It's put down in cold blood. Uh, Levine was the leader, was, was taken, put on trial for, uh, uh, for, for, well, not for, for instigating mutiny, for treachery, and he gave a speech to the court before he was hung, that he was uh, for the communist cause, there were only dead men walking, and I will not be the last, I will be the first, but we will gain victory, courageous people. But it shows how, how the counter-revolution moves when it has, when it has to move, if you like. And they overthrew the Bavarian uh, revolution, the Hungarian revolution. You hear about the Finnish revolution tomorrow. When the, when the counter-revolution acts, it acts decisively in the most cold-blooded manner in order to present, preserve capitalism. Of course... 
the revolution is not just one act. And you have a shift between revolution and counter-revolution. But the counter-revolution also cannot succeed because of the power of the working class. And that they are not content unless they have full control. The social democrats, well, they are a stopgap. We've used them. They've done the deed. Let's get rid of them now. Let's have the real generals in power. And that's what they did. In March 1920, they staged a coup, the Kapuch, where they were told they had to disarm, and they refused. And the leaders of the armed forces said, we're not going to disarm. You dissolve the parliament. There's an actual threat. You dissolve the parliament. And they refused and they said they called on the rest of the armed forces to put down this this uprising, this coup. And they refused because they're all in a league. And the armed forces marched into Berlin. And they disposed the government. And they put into place a man called Cap. He was a politician. And yet uh, there was a general strike called, and the whole place was paralyzed. It was from the trade union leads actually had, had, had ridiculed the idea of a general strike for 20 years. They didn't believe in a general strike. But they were given the option you either capitulate to the military, that means going to prison, or make a call for a general strike, even if you don't believe in it. So they called for a general strike, and to their surprise, the general strike was solid. Masses of workers in it, the biggest movement of the working class since the revolution, paralyzed the whole of Berlin, paralyzed the cities elsewhere. And, and this guy, Cap, the leader, was supposed to be the, the, uh, the imposed <coughs> prime minister, he couldn't even find a stenographer to write down the instruction that he was now in power. Because everybody was on strike. <laughs> and the army, within four days, had to march out to Berlin with their tails between their legs. They were defeated by the, st the strength of the working class. And the working class could have come to power then, in 1920. They had the power. They, they got, the, the official government had gone into hiding when, when, the, when the military came. Power was in the hands, again, of the working class. But they had no party. So they handed it back once again to the Social Democrats. And that was a, a failed opportunity. The biggest change, which I haven't got time to go into because of the lack of time here, but was the creation of the Communist Party in 1920. It was a small organisation to begin with, but this big organisation, the Independents, which had now grown to about 500,000, it became bigger than the Social Democrats, <coughs> were affected by the, the mood of revolution in Europe. And they were what you might call a centrist organization. That is, they were becoming very left-wing in words. Marxist revolution. And they were affected by the, by the revolution in Germany and the Russian revolution. And they voted in October at a conference in Harle after a four-hour intervention. I haven't got four hours to it. A four-hour intervention from uh, Zinoviev, who was the head of the Communist International, they voted as a majority to change the name of the party to a communist party. So instead of a small group in Germany, then the communist party now became a mass organization of, a, of half a million workers. It was the biggest communist party in the world outside of Russia. And uh, the opportunity for, for coming to power once again was placed in the, into the hands of the possibilities, at least, into the hands of the German working class itself. Unfortunately, I don't have uh, four hours like Zinoviev, and therefore I'm not able to go through uh, the trials and tribulations, if you like, over the next period, because the workers had opportunities. Unfortunately, the communist leaders really weren't up to scratch, they weren't up to the, the task. Above all, in 1923, that was the biggest opportunity 
Here you had a revolutionary situation in Germany again, bigger than in 1918. You had the occupation of the Ruhr by the French because the, the government had refused to pay, rep they couldn't pay the reparations. There was a colossal inflation in Germany, hyperinflation. Um, for instance, uh, a statistic that, that sort of comes to mind that um, one egg, everybody's familiar with an egg, one egg in 1918, the price of one egg in 1918, the price of that one egg in 1918 would buy you how many eggs in 1923? One egg in 1918, how many in 1923? 500 million. <laughs> 500 million. That's an indication of the inflation the, 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 the mark wasn't worth the pay, its paper it was printed on. It was completely valued. Children were playing games, so they were sold as scrap paper. But those on fixed in incomes were starving. The middle class collapsing. People who were, who were going into the rubbish bins because they couldn't afford to, to eat. The whole place was aflame with revolution at that time because of the occupation, the inflation, the crisis. And millions of workers were now looking to the Communist Party, but unfortunately, the Communist Party was uh, thinking it was simply uh, not a revolution, basically, until it was too late. And then you can't just play with the revolution. You either prepare the ground and take power, or you'll miss the boat, you'll miss the opportunity. And that's what it happened in 1923. Again, it was a huge tragedy, because all these defeats were demoralising the working class in Germany and were prepared in the ground then for a move towards reaction. Uh, at a later date, it is true, but the capitalists in Germany were, deci were de decided by 1928 that the only solution to their problems was fascism and that the ruination of the, of the middle class uh, provided the, the basis for the, the development of the Hitler movement. Although Hitler could have been smashed if they had the unity of the workers' organisations, which I haven't got time to go into because it's a, a broader question, but they were divided, they were split. The biggest working class in the world, they were split and were basically paralysed. And they could have smashed Hitler. He could have been done away with it. He admits it. You know, we, we were disordered. We could have been uh, uh, swept aside. But the working class was split down the middle because of the false policies of the Social Democrats and of the Stalinists at this particular time, which played a, an abominable role. Anyway, this, you can see that the Germany is full of uh, lessons. Because this is not a history. You know, uh, history is for academics. This is lessons. Lessons for, for us to learn about the experiences of the past. Yeah, the defeats and the victories... That, you know, the lessons are paid for very, very dearly by the working class. And Marxism attempts to learn those lessons, generalizes those, les those lessons. That's theory. Theory is just generalized historical experience, that's all. But it's very valuable experience. It means that we don't have to go through the, every painful lesson of the past. We learn from it. We learn from the, the defeats. We learn from all these tragedies in order that we prepare ourselves for what is coming. And in Europe and in the world today, given the crisis of capitalism, there's going to be a new revolutionary wave itself. Even the capitalists know this, this, this movement towards um, populism. You know, in America, in Europe and so on, they've lost control of the situation. The stability is completely evaporated. It's instability now on a world scale because of the capitalist crisis. And it's because of this crisis that workers themselves will be pushed into changing their system, changing society, challenging the attacks of the capitalist class, renovating their organisation, becoming political. What is a revolution anyway? A revolution is only a mass change in consciousness because workers draw conclusions at different times, that sometimes they all come together and it affects everybody. I've seen revolutions. I've seen it in France in 1968, or revolution situation, should we say. 
in Portugal, in Greece, in Spain, in Venezuela. Many different countries experience revolutions because of the contradictions of the system itself. But now what you have is world contradictions and a world crisis. And that's affecting every country of the world. We're all interconnected. And events in one country affect every other country. And that's why revolutionary movements are going to be on the order of the day. But we therefore have to learn the lessons of the past. So we don't have the defeats of the past. That we have a revolution. Yeah, hey, revolutions are coming whether we like it or not. The big thing is, are they going to be successful or not? That's the $64,000 question. And the only way they can be successful is to be led by a leadership that's prepared to go all the way and carry through the revolution to a conclusion. And that means building up a Marxist tendency within the working class before events happen. That's the lesson in Germany, surely. Or prepared in the ground before the events occur so that you can be there and influence events, transform events, prevent a defeat, guarantee a victory. That's up to us. No one else is going to do it. You know, it's not a question of fate. Working people make their own history, but we make it under conditions we don't control. We have to see our, our role in this of being a, a factor, an important factor in how to change society. Because all the ingredients can be there. They were in Germany there. All the objective situations, wonderful objective situations. But what was lacking was the subjective factor. In other words, the, the leadership that could carry it through. And that's why Trotsky once said that the, the crisis facing humanity is a crisis of leadership. And that's the truth today as it was then. And that's the task that we have to change. This ingredient, the important task, your task, of building an international Marxist tendency, as we are doing it with the international Marxist tendency, to fulfill that potential when it arises. It's going to arise, but we've got to be prepared for it. We have to dedicate ourselves to ensure a success, because one country, that's all it would be, successful, would transform the entire world. One revolution. And they realised that. Such is the crisis affected all countries. It would spread like wildfire. And therefore the idea in our time, not so long, this crisis is, they're heading for a new world crisis now, a new slump. With Trump, they're going to head for a new, new depression, with a trade war. Revolution's going to be on the order of the day. Our task is to make it successful. That's your task. It's our task. Let's do it.